All right, welcome everybody. We have, um, um, we'll, we'll give it a, a minute or so. Uh, please uh, join the chat. Let us know where you're joining from today. Um, we are really excited. We've have, had over 900 registered for this event. There's obviously a lot of interest in the topic of sleep. Um, we're excited for this conversation. Um, so we'll just give it a minute or so, um, allow people to, to join the conversation. Um, like I said, yeah, let us know uh, where you're joining from and there will be a lot of opportunity uh, to contribute to the Q&A today. Um, and uh, very fortunate to have Moira here to answer some of the more specific questions that come up. Um, and yeah, we'll kick off in, in probably about 30 seconds. All right, Maura, what do you think? Should we get going? Yes, I think so. I'm just enjoying watching where everyone's from. It's a great, great array of places. Yeah, let's let's kick this thing off. Perfect. Um, okay, well, I, I want to start today um, by acknowledging the country's First Nations, people in their ongoing strength to practicing the world's oldest living culture. Um, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and waters in which we meet, and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, for some of us who work in this domain, um, this is a little bit like Christmas, World Sleep Day is happening this Friday. Um, it's, it's such a ubiquitous universal topic. Um, so Friday the 17th of March, and the theme for this year is sleep is essential for health. And, and that will very much be embedded into the fabric of, of today's conversation. Um, most of us, uh, the, on, on average, will spend 25 of our living years um, asleep um, and in, in, in some way, shape or form. So uh, clearly evolution has uh, indicated that this is something that uh, is very important to our survival. Um, good sleep, we know it boosts immunity, um, it lowers our risk of health problems, and uh, it generally, as, as we can all relate, makes us a better version of ourselves. Um, what bad sleep conversely will do, and, and it will tank our cognitive ability and our memory, um, it causes injury and it opens up all manner of illnesses. 30% um, of us statistically um, do report as having trouble sleeping regularly. Um, and for 12 to 15% of the population, um, that problem is uh, chronic and it's diagnosable. Uh, so that, that sort of marked impairment also presents um, work health and safety challenges when we apply uh, the workplace lens, which will be the lens in which some of you are coming to this conversation today. Um, as I said, we're going to make this uh, session as interactive as possible. Maura and I have agreed that um, we're going to resist the temptation to use slides and diagrams, uh, and we have uh, a conversation template that we're going to be working through. Um, so I'll int introduce myself first for, for those of you that haven't met me. So uh, I'm Matt Meth and I'm based in Sydney um, and I lead Unmind's uh, local operations here in Australia. Um, we have the good fortune of having access to uh, a, a, a global uh, data set on this. And we know that um, from the data that's reported through our platform, we through the employers we work with, two and a half million employees around the world um, have access to Unmind. Uh, and sleep is the most persistent challenge that people report. Um, and that, uh, uh, that challenge presents across industries, across countries and cultures. Um, so uh, we will be applying that lens today as well. Um, I am very, very pleased to introduce, and this, this is one of uh, the favorite, my favorite introductions that I received last year. So um, a, a, a prominent sleep scientist, uh, I'm not sure, Tiano, if you're joining us today, um, my good friend Tiana Roebuck from Alfred Health had introduced me to Maura Younger. Um, last year. Moira is uh, one of the foremost sleeper experts in Australia, um, and you'll see that very quickly as we start to, um, to share her expertise in the conversation today. Um, Moira, I'd love to take a moment for you to introduce yourself and the work that you do, um, and then the two of us can, can, can jump into the conversation. Great. Thanks, Matt, and hello, everyone. 
Um, yeah, so uh, I'm still a reluctant expert, or that, or that lovely introduction. Um, I still feel that it's just something I uh, have just such a huge passion for and then have just stayed in it for so long. So when I, it's a long story, I'll keep it brief, but how I got to be doing what I'm doing today is that I uh, was a registered nurse and working at the Alfred Hospital and I decided, probably because of the shift work, actually, I, it was a pretty tricky gig. Um, I thought, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. I don't think I can stay up all night when I'm in my 50s and 60s. So career-wise, I thought I might actually become a psychologist instead. So while I was studying to become a psychologist, the Alfred opened up the Sleep Disorder Centre in 1994. And so it was this amazing opportunity to learn to be a sleep scientist. I was putting electrodes on people's heads. I was already a nurse, so I could do, you know, blood gases and, ven um, you know, venous blood and ECGs. So I had a fantastic time there and did research there and just morphed, you know, ended up studying and studying and studying, but doing a doctorate in health psychology. Just kept going because I loved it. And then, went, then because of that, I had so many contacts in the sleep world and got lots of referrals and, and then... You know, years, decades on, I joined the board of the Sleep Health Foundation. And then at the end of 21, the board was talking about having the inaugural CEO. And everyone thought, why would Moira won't go for it? She's you know, so embedded in her clinical work and her research. But I actually was ready for a change. Um, I, to, to be honest, I was quite burnt out from um, COVID in Melbourne and the psychology work. I was trying to be all things to all people and working till nine o'clock at night and just did myself in. And so I took on the CEO role. And so what I'm doing now, uh, and I'll shut up soon, a bit of a long introduction, um, but I'm really much more interested in prevention and awareness and education uh, and also give, teaching people how to sleep well. But I realised that I can't keep doing what I was doing just in a little room, in a reactive way, one patient at a time is never going to have that impact that I want to have with teaching people how to sleep better because sleep is such an essential part of our health. Thank you very much. And let's now, we are going to resist the urge to use slides. Um, <laughs> thank you. And, and, and Maury's joining us from Melbourne as well. Um, so yeah, let, let's get into it. I think that that really explains a little bit of the context that you bring to the conversation. Um, I think a, a, a secondarily, a really good place to start is, is your belief on why um, sleep is so important. Um, and I'd love yeah any of that sort of foundational evidence that, that you're working uh, from. Yeah, well, I mean, there's so many. The levels are, you know, economic. Um, they're to do with psychosocial risk. They're to do with mental health. They're to do with our relationships and just how nice we are to each other. They're to do with road safety. So, the the levels are so they're broad and they're deep, um, and what where the essential uh, aspects of sleep health are and where my interests are. And it's sort of a strength, it's sort of, it's a strength of ours as a, as a foundation and as a, a sort of a, a topic, as sort of a pet topic, but you can imagine it's also a weakness because when I go and talk to particularly say workplaces um, or whatever, actually whatever group it is, there's, there's all these challenges there because sometimes it's just too, it's too ubiquitous. Um, it's too hard. Sometimes people say, well, I don't even know how to measure it. Like, what, what do you mean? How do we know when someone's sleepy and tired from the work they're doing or is it their mental health is it because they're just watching too much telly is it because they're doing like three gigs at once and so the, in terms of the responsibility of the workplace sometimes it's really it's a really gray area that we're seeking to make it much clearer and in terms of public health messaging it's really hard it's not we don't have the equivalent of slip slop slap just yet and those of you who aren't in Australia um, we had a very successful um, health campaign um, around, you know, uh, teaching people the awareness of um, the dangers of sunbathing and, you know, melanoma risk. So it was a simple, simple, simple slogan, simple slip, slop, slap, and we don't have the equivalent yet for, for that. But but so, so yeah, so sleep, uh, it's, it's all things in terms of our mental health, our, our physical health. Um, it's kind of, you know, it's just as important as diet and exercise, but hasn't yet had the public health campaigns hasn't yet got that kind of momentum behind it, hasn't got the public health awareness. And it's sort of, um, it, it's got media awareness, interestingly. People will be saying, what do you mean no one's talking about sleep? Because it's, it's, it's often talked about in the media, um, social media as well. It's become a TikTok phenomenon. 
which is a the, sort of the, a bit of another story, which I hope we might talk about later. If there's a question about that, because it's um, it's problematic, but it's also we need, we need to use we need to work out how to in, um, harness that rather than hindering our messages. Yeah, and I guess um, you know I, I guess the, the 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 place that you come from is very much the scientific scientific evidence based approach. Um, do you get concerned at times when you see um, inconsistent messaging or perhaps messaging that um, doesn't support the evidence base that you're working from? Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's a hugely frustrating thing. Um, and I think that people will, you believe anything sometimes. If you're desperate for sleep or, and you'll buy anything, you would spend, you know, $5,000 on a gadget if it promised you good sleep. Because I know the desperation of people when they're not sleeping well it's like torture and people know that, you know, in um, in war, et cetera, like sleep deprivation is a form of torture. So when people are not experiencing good sleep through no fault of their own, they're actually despite best efforts and despite prioritising it, it's the most debilitating thing. And I suppose that's why I jumped out of it. So one of the reasons I jumped out of the clinical life into this sort of life is for sometimes concern around the evidence base but also concern around the public health messaging around, because yeah, the, sci the science does tell us how scary it is that, you know, that you will be at great increased risk of cardiovascular disease, cognitive decline in some dementias, some cancers, you know, type two diabetes, more risk of obesity, mental health conditions, you know, risk, obviously acute things like car crashes and falling off ladders at work, all sorts of things that are real, real risks, but it's actually hard. I, I, when I hear that on the radio, when I, you know, 10 years ago, I don't, I don't want to see the headlines of, you know, less than eight hours sleep is going to give you dementia because it's actually not true. Even though it's true that there are these correlations and there's risks associated and it's quite clear evidence. My job was not my, not my personal job. The, the people like us, like people doing public health messaging or people doing workplace talks or whatever your role is, it's it's so important to make sure that we have a nuanced message, and that we also every time we're talking about sleep, that we have we back it up with solutions at the same time, that we're not just having all the bad news. But maybe people in the audience can help me with this later on, open up to more discussion. My problem I'm finding now is that I'm too nuanced, and I'm too oh, but there's these solutions, and so we're not getting government funding or getting what we need, I need to be saying, you know, 2 million Australians are going to die next year because of sleep loss and, 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 and oh, my God, they can't afford to ignore us anymore and we'll get the proper funding for, because a foundation like us should be funded in the same way that the Heart Foundation is funded or diabetes or, uh, you know, mental, Beyond Blue and, you know, mental health associations get government funding, rightly so. And our argument is that we need funding too to be able to do these sorts of things, like to go out and give, you know, to have really good resources on our website to go and give good talks, for me to build my team, like to have, you know, I want to layers, a few, few floors, you know, we want to lots of different people working eventually for the Sleep Health Foundation. But, yeah, so it worries me greatly um, and we need to, I suppose, the more I talk, the more we can get the influencers off the front page who don't have a lot of depth of what they're saying or the, yeah, the TikTokers going on about pink noise and brown noise and green noise and that's become a phenomenon but it's not even a thing. There's no, it's it's just, I mean, generally speaking, white noise or, you know, background noise in general can help people with sleep in some circumstances, but it certainly shouldn't be the, it's not the, it's not our key message, <laughs> you know, it's not, and then those the, the different noises are just different frequencies, apparently. I, I had to look it up, I had to look it up for an interview on the radio, because I thought, I don't know what that is, I don't know what, this is about last year sometime, I don't know what pink noise is. <laughs> and then in the same week, I had a request for brown noise and pink noise and green noise. And I thought, is this a joke? I mean, is this someone having a go at me? But they, it's a real thing that people are talking about because people are wanting innovation. They want, the, they want the latest gadget. They want to sell that. And then the journalists in health magazines and on tech magazines, they want to be having good, cool stories with cool headlines. And so it's not bad messaging. It's just that it's our, our real messaging about the basics. I haven't got out there yet. So. This is what we, so yeah, so what do we recommend to help with sleep? So yeah, so I mean, you through the questions you've got, we'll, we'll answer all these we'll, things. We will cover that, yeah. yeah. I think I wanted to start, I mean, some, something we have um, 371 now joining us. We love adjectives. I would love, um, for those of you willing, drop uh, a one word adjective in the chat to describe how you slept last night. Um, I think I'm really curious about the variety of, of answers that we'll get here, Maura. 
been yeah. disrupted. disrupted. Sporadic, terrible. terrible. Right. Yeah, Sporadic's well, come up right. a few times. <laughs> I've seen a couple of good ones, mostly not good. Superficial, right. that's a good yeah. description. Um, yeah, because I think where I would like to go next is I think people, there is a lot more awareness around sleep. There's gizmos and gadgets and rings and bracelets and, um, you know, uh, in addition to interventions that are pretty well, pretty well established. And we know, um, you know, some probably the most popular content in the Unmind platform, platform is the, the bedtime stories um, and the psychoacoustics, which can, can help sleep. So I think I'm seeing a proliferation of, of gizmos and gadgets. Where, where I would like to go next is, um, Maura, the 30% the of people who report as having difficulty with their sleep and, and perhaps they over-index um, and joining us today, and then the 12 to 15% where that is chronic neck, chronic and diagnosable. I would love your advice to those people on um, what that distinction might be and at what point uh, they might need um, to take a more serious look at some professional support. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so, the, yeah, the people who don't sleep well is just, you know, generally not sleeping well for whatever reason. But if it's diagnosed insomnia, it means that it's despite adequate opportunity and that it's not due to anything else like another medical condition, not due to substance use or other medications. And that happens more often than not, like most nights of the week, and it's been for several months, and it has marked impairment on your functioning. So socially and or occupationally, so your quality of life. So they're the things that it can be either difficulty getting off to sleep, can be maintaining sleep, can be waking too early, or could be feeling non-restored by your sleep. So it could be all four of those things, could be a combination, and maybe it changes over time. So the person having difficulty sleeping, sometimes they, if they don't know why, like it's then then um yes several exactly having lots of having several children having shift work all that sort of stuff is not despite adequate opportunity you haven't had the opportunity and sometimes if it's because your you know your shift work or it's because you've other other conditions it's not insomnia so it's insomnia when it's just all those other things so that so the other bracket so the so maybe 15 20 percent or so of people who they're not meeting diagnostic criteria but still having shocking sleep and feeling awful Sometimes it's like what we're starting to coin the term of asomnia, just of absence of sleep, like difficulty even getting into the bedroom. And sometimes that's because of just of workload or procrastination or being addicted to other things. Or not even addicted, addiction sounds a bit dramatic, but just being really busy with your other with your life or watching too much TV, finding it really difficult to unwind in time. Um, and there's the amount of stress. It's 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 very much stress induced, stress related, and not having routines of and not having the access to the light dark cycle that we used to have in more primitive times. So in more primitive times, our primitive ancestors and even our not even primitive ancestors, our own parents and their parents, just had a slower life, a more predictable life, more routines. Generally speaking, this is. Um, obviously there was war-torn times and it's not about like this utopia but in general the way we worked and lived was different and in terms of pre-industrialization as well that we probably had much more access to natural light and, and natural dark and so at the moment one of the biggest things is how much light we have and that's not only from the screens this conversation we could be having even 1996 before people had like screens in their bedrooms and handheld devices because the mobile phones that were around then were just bricks that people kept, you know, it wasn't exciting to be honest. It was no computer in it. It was just a phone. So it's pretty much um, routine, 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 consistency, consistency is the key that a lot of people don't have for various reasons. The light, dark cycle and getting, getting having your own sleep pressure and your own circadian system being in, in line and being able to manage work life. So, you know, external and internal disruptions so whether it's your mind whether it's your health whether it's not eating enough whether it's too much caffeine whether it's um, too much other stuff cbd oils we can, we'll get onto that later because it's um that's a really hot topic there'll be questions certainly about cbd there'll be certainly questions about melatonin there'll be certainly questions about jet lag and i'm happy to answer all those but in i suppose building their principles at the moment building what you know the, the principles of good sleep health and why we're having so much difficulty 
um, is that yeah that sleep pressure people it's what it's generally lack of education because we haven't people haven't really talked about it when they're at school it was not in the curriculum still not really some schools have it some don't it's not in the curriculum of healthcare professionals not really the average in Australia for psychologists and medical doctors is one hour across their studies to know about sleep. So that's the average. So 47% had stayed on zero. They don't get education about sleep and, and circadian systems. So it's an emerging field. We're in our um, embryonic stages, like 30 years in Australia. Um, you know, so the Sleep Health Foundation is, say, 12 years in. So it's actually a really, really new thing um, in Australia, yeah. particularly. You know, United States may be a little bit ahead of maybe the 80s. So the so these so the difference is I suppose that occupational functioning in your quality of life and and despite best efforts like if you thought you know what I, I think I just need to tidy up my life a little bit I need to probably need to just turn off the tally a bit earlier get a bit of discipline around that I need to manage my workload and my stress and I've got that awful relationship I'm in or in that awful workplace I'm in and maybe knowing what the causes are will help people to know where they can make the changes or sometimes it is just again yeah, I think well I don't eat properly. Um, I have too much stimulation in my life, whether you know, whether it's what you're putting in your mouth or what you what your work is. Um, yeah, so I'm just distracted by the questions there. I don't know. I, um, I'll let you do the questions. Though. <laughs> yeah, but what we I might get, we'll get do, to them later. Yeah, um, for anybody that has a kind of a formal question, what what I've chosen, we're, we're going to reserve at least twenty minutes at the end um, instead of the chat box, so that it doesn't get lost. If you could please drop. Um, any questions that you would really like us to answer in the Q&A box, um, and then we'll revisit that uh, in, in about 20 minutes here and, and make sure that we do our best efforts to get through those. Um, I think where I wanted to go next is, I, I have seen a swing from um, people that idolized those individuals and public figures that uh, existed on very little sleep to there being a, a, a real value of sleep. Um, and a pressure and, and a stress and, and perhaps people feel that sense of guilt that they're not getting enough sleep and I remember from one of our earliest conversations the example that you told me was the people that are in bed um, perhaps it's 1 30 in the morning and they're starting to get more and more anxious that they're not sleeping in some cases your advice to them is get out of bed do something entirely different and reset I would love you to share that example and, and that kind yeah. of different mindset of, of thinking about this yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a really important one that often people don't realise that sleep effort or you know, trying too hard for those conscientious people and people who are desperate for it, it it's, it's just not getting them anywhere. So a really key fundamental principle within people, treating people with insomnia, uh, and I use that word just sort of at the moment, I'll use that broadly for any difficulty with sleeping, whether you've got the diagnosis or not, or whether you do meet criteria. Um, I think, so So sleep restriction therapy, it's called, or bed restriction, and also stimulus control is what I'm, this is the two things I'm talking about when I answer this question, Matt, is that you don't want to be lying in bed awake for any longer than what feels like about half an hour, really, across the bed, the, the whole sleep period. So whether that's the start of the bed, it's time, the sleep period, the middle of the night, or the wee hours, if you're lying there and you're meant to be asleep or want to be asleep, and you're not and you're frustrated you absolutely must get out of the bed and go and do something else so whether depends on your situation where you sometimes you might just have to lie on the floor in your room and not turn lights on or you might have the luxury of going to another bedroom or a lounge room or something like that so you go somewhere else and you wait you do something non-stimulating in the dark like just maybe a head torch if you want to read just something really really boring don't do housework don't do moving around some people talk about, oh, I did the vacuuming. I said, no, don't do the vacuuming. Like you wake yourself. So, so do something that's sedentary and do something where you're in the dark because you don't want to turn on all the lights in, the, in your, because we, we haven't got onto that yet, but like the whole process of sleep um, is very much around melatonin becoming, at, you know, we secreted ourselves and we want it to be um, at, at optimal periods through the night and it's suppressed by bright light. So you don't want to put the lights on. So that, so the person lying in bed, tossing and turning, needs to get out, go somewhere else, wait for a period of time, and we don't know exactly that it would be either five minutes later or it could be an hour later, it could be two hours later. You're not going to be looking at any kind of device. You might just wait until you're calmed down again, wait until you feel sleepy as well as tired. So that distinguished is really important too. People don't remember what it feels like to feel sleepy because they're tired all the time 
but there's a process or pattern of being tired but wired. So just too tired to sleep almost. Is it is a phenomenon overstimulating? You're too tired to sleep because you're so wired. But sleepy means your eyes are a bit ting you're sleepy like sleepy is what you're waiting for both usually don't really go anywhere near your bed until you're sleepy and tired in the middle of the night too if you just go and do something else come back to bed when you're a bit sleepy and then see how you go again like try again that is a really tricky thing so it's very hard to do that if you're anxious and you just see all this oh this I don't believe in this process you have to really kind of be a true believer in this process Take my word for that it does work. It's evidence-based from the 1970s. It's a really, really long time ago now that we know this theory works for you know, stimulus control as well as bed restrictions. So making sure that you don't do anything else in bed but sleep and making sure that you don't stay in bed awake, particularly if you're frustrated, for what feels like any more than you know, 20, 30 minutes. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a hard one. It's, that's the, it's the essence of how most people I've worked with clinically over the years have got better. Um, it's that. It's not jumping. Because they, they show me their sleep diary and they're getting to bed at 10 o'clock. But they haven't been to sleep before one thirty for about eight years. I said, well, why are you getting to bed at 10? Because They said, well, because I want to maximise my opportunity for sleep. I, I, I get up at 6, so I've got to get in there at 10. I said, well, and I understand it's logical. It's really And, and the people prone to sleep problems are quite conscientious, quite high in empathy quite high in worry though and and very diligent and conscientious so do things a bit bit rigidly and so you have to sort of undo that work a little bit for the people prone to sleep problems who and you know who you are you're listening in the audience you you know a lot of these and especially the audience that do opt into these kind of webinars have got sleep difficulties themselves that's why there's so much a high interest in it so that person needs to, yeah, to to be a bit less, be, be a bit kinder to themselves, and just and be have this trust that you to get better sleep, you almost got to go backwards a little bit and do this kind of counterintuitive, paradoxical approaches that's different to what you've been trying and trying for years. And we we use the word sleep effort. If there's sleep effort in what you're doing, if you think, yeah, I do put effort in, I really kind of think about it during the day, even and like. I kind of, you know, put all these things in these rituals in place. If there's effort there, mostly, if you've got in some, if you're prone to sleep, it's going to probably backfire. We're going to have this paradoxical approach of just waiting for it to come to you a bit more. So have good, clean lifestyle, manage your workload, manage your stress, get your light and the dark, light, dark hues at the right time, and don't jump into bed until your body and brain tell you that, gee, I'm sleepy, I really need to get into bed now. And whether that says 10 o'clock or 1.30 a.m. temporarily, like, you know, you've got to do that for a while and then build up to getting more sleep. If indeed you are a long sleeper, some people at the end of our work together, we might have had six, eight sessions over, you know, six months and they don't get any more than six hours sleep, but they're feeling terrific. They were never eight hours sleepers anyway. So it's just sort of, you know, really think about what you are. Like people know intuitively, maybe on holidays, how they feel if they do get better sleep. And whether yeah. there's some anywhere between six to ten hours is considered normal, and seven to nine is what we recommend, and eight is the average. So it's really it's like saying everyone should have size eight feet. It's just it's a it's not true. It's like it's it's a big variation of what's considered normal, and the recommendations yeah. could be you know they're just not right for you. You've got to know what what's the best for you and how you feel. Yeah, well, I think if if there's a tagline for today that everybody can easily remember, it's tired but wired and thinking of that nuance between being tired and being sleepy uh, I think that's really good practical advice um I think you, you we've alluded to a bit of and I don't know that we need to spend a lot more time on this but it's the question was is technology changing the way we sleep I think it's very clear the answer is yes um maybe yes. more you can describe a couple of key ways that technology um is used uh, well it is perhaps preventing quality sleep and then some ways that you've seen technology be used in a really positive way. You talked about that innovation. Yeah, I was going to say that technology can be really great for, say, even people who want to have some kind of white noise background. It might really, really helps them with their brain. Often um, people who are, you know, not neurotypical, neurodiverse, it's a it's a fabulous thing. People can have little apps and things or fans or, you know, for, for, for that and just could switch off and concentrate on one particular sound that's been really helpful I think uh, yeah listening to podcasts and things like that where people can um, 
be in there, but just think, oh, I'll just put it in for five seconds, put it onto something that's going to finish in 15 minutes anyway, the timer. That can be really great for helping people sleep. Where it where it's become problematic, and that I mean, most of us grew up like in the last 10 years, anyone who say in the, only in their 20s, they grew up with messages at school, get off your screens, you know, an hour or two before bed and all that. We know no one listened to that. We do a show of hands, even in a sleep conference, and nearly everyone, it's kids, adults, nearly everyone has some kind of technology in their bedroom. So we've got to be a bit more realistic about the nuance around the messages with that. Where it is problematic is when it's too much high engagement. So too much, just kind of sucked into whatever it is, whether it's, whether it's gaming, whether it's buying things, whether it's watching things, whatever it is that, you, that the level of engagement is just too high and that you're missing, people miss their tired signs and their sleepiness signs and miss and the bright light. If they haven't got the right sort of filters on, they're having blue light coming into their eyes, which is the very one that suppresses melatonin. And you don't want, you want melatonin suppressed all through the day. So I want you with, you want bright blue light. I mean, this is, there's a rainbow of colours out there that none of us see them. I mean, I don't have special powers to see the colour of the rainbow, um, but we know the blue light is the one. So during the day, definitely immerse yourself in bright, bright, bright light. And in, in the nighttime, in pre-bed conditions, immerse yourself in dim light. So I want you, when it's dark outside of an evening, I want your house to reflect that. So you don't want to walk past people's houses and say all the lights on. Just have have lamps on. Um, have make sure that you've got the right filters on screens if you're on them. You know, it is it is still a recommendation to have a buffer, like just get off some you know interactive, stimulating work. It's different. TV is fine. Like it's not. It's very passive. You're not really interacting with it. Usually the light is across the room and it's not in your eyes anyway. So we're talking about really engaging high, sort of almost high octave activities is where this technology is problematic. But it's really important to remember that it's not only technology, because I'm old enough to have been seeing people with sleep problems in the 1990s, as I said. And some people, like I said this in a podcast recently, and they thought I was joking because <laughs> it was a woman who had problems. It wasn't that she was addicted to a screen. She was addicted to knitting. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't put the knitting that she was actually procrastinating and not going into bed because it was her time it was you know that was she worked she had kids and she wanted to stay up she knitted and knitted and knitted and it was, it was sort of the obsession I see sometimes with screen time so it's not it's sort of the, it's the engagement with whatever it is and at the moment it happens to be mostly screens um yeah so yeah so I'd love to um I didn't notice the thing about the power nap can I answer that quickly about the power nap? Which is while yeah, I'm, thinking of it? I'm curious too. Yeah. <laughs> the power nap is the best thing, particularly in this society, especially if I see the group, everyone, nearly everyone said they had terrible sleep last night. So if you're not yeah. getting good sleep for whatever reason, um, and so this is the problem of not having, I, I do miss my little room sometimes when you're dealing with someone and their individual issues. But on a broad, uh, broad message is that napping, short naps are very, very important. And the power nap just means like less than 20 minutes. It means short and sweet and powerful. And if you wake up out of a longer sleep than 20 minutes or 30 minutes, you're more likely to wake up out of deep sleep. So if you look at it, if I did have my slides, which I'm, I'm getting used to not having, you see that you get into, you start off with stage one sleep and then two, maybe that's in the first half an hour. And then it gets much deeper, but you know, 45 minutes on, plus you're in really deep sleep. And maybe an hour or so in, you might get a bit of REM. And the first cycle is an hour and a half, and you keep having an hour and a half cycles, the rest, maybe five more of those, if you're lucky, throughout the night. So if you sleep for a little bit of time, like 20 minutes, you're very, very, very unlikely, unless you're super, super sleep deprived, you're very unlikely to wake up out of deep sleep. You're mostly likely you're still going to be in this lovely stage one sleep, sleep where you've just gone into a little bit of sleep, but it's very refreshing. You'll, you'll buy yourself two hours of alertness. And so that's why the road safety messages are so clear around. I think the billboards used to say twenty minutes. Now they're in a sort. They say, they say nice. fifteen. Um, they say fifteen minutes for um, power naps. And so because people are more and more sleep deprived, so the, yeah, the short naps are good. They're better off about say seven hours before. So they have them over and done with by three or four p.m. Two or three or four p.m. So that you don't interfere with your major sleep period. But a short nap, less than half an hour, is unlikely to interfere with your nighttime sleep period. 
And you're also unlikely to wake up at it in what we call sleep inertia, where you feel really groggy and you don't know what's going on because you've been in this deep sleep. The good news about that, though, is that that will last, that mostly you last less than 10 minutes, that you, you can just get going again after a while. But on the by the roadside, you don't want to, that's why they have to have short naps because you'll, you don't want to be driving along then feeling more dazed and confused than you were before you had the nap. So I think we've come a long way with road safety messages and napping, a lot more than we have in the workplace and just general life, school kids. We've got so much work to be done and we just got to just got to just keep chipping away at it. But with with uh, more of a from consolidated, united approach, because there's a lot of conflicting, you know, there's a lot of conflicting advice out there. Um, sorry, next question. I, I'm kind of going on. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's good. I, my internet dropped and I've just reappeared. So that was, oh. um, I think, you know, we talk about power naps, but to, for you to give that um, kind of those clear parameters and the clear definition, I think probably really helps everybody as well. And I'm personally pleased that you are endorsement of, uh, of power naps. Yeah. Um, yes. We've had lots of questions. So th there's, there's two, I think one, which might be quicker and then we'll go to, um to supplements, but yeah, I think the, the, a lot of the, Classic advice was uh, get off a screen and read a book. I know a lot of people now are reading books through e-readers or devices. Um, do you have any advice on there and particular devices? And it sounds like maybe blocking out blue light, anything that yeah. you would recommend we look for in, in that regard? Yeah, I think the only thing with whether you choose a book or an e-reader, is just it's just only to do with the light. So just making sure that it's not lighting up your face and putting potential blue light into your eyes which would suppress your melatonin or minimise, you know, delay the onset of melatonin. Because melatonin is what we need to feel that lovely sleepiness, that propensity of a sleepiness that comes eventually. And it also comes at the same time as a, a core body temperature drop. So we need to make sure that we're not still tearing around and doing stuff. So hence the sort of sitting down, perhaps on the couch, music or favourite TV show or favourite pet, favourite person. Um, whatever it is for you to start having the right cues of I've done my work, my day is done. Even if you hasn't, your day's not done. Sometimes you think, oh gosh, I didn't do that, 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 and that. But putting it on to some kind of either real or imagined to do list that you just you just write write it off and start your unwinding period. So every single person needs some kind of unwinding period. So some kind of buffer um, to get you know to to start getting the right. Uh, conditions if you like because even because the melatonin and the body temperature all that stuff is not going to come if you're still moving or if you're still in too much light if you're if the lounge room looks like a you know a casino so yeah it's making sure you're in mood lighting like fall back in love with your house fall back in love with your with going to sleep and you know get it get really just think look you know the day is done I've got to get to sleep at some point so but and, and be aware that what works for you uh, it's not going to work for your partner and there's people who are just pre-programmed to be people who just don't want to go to sleep till after 12 and some people who really want to go to sleep at nine and it, you kind of you are who you are a bit like your eye color it's mostly genetically determined and we can massage it a little bit and you can masquerade as a night owl or a morning type but you have to really work at it and you've got to be very consistent even on your days off so you, you know you, if you're because a lot of people are night owls, but they're having these, you know, long commutes and they're getting up at before six and they're really wrecking themselves and not getting enough sleep. But at least make sure you jump into bed as much as you can because if you're getting up at six and you're getting the light in your eyes, you will be sleepy. You know, you'll get this sleep pressure where you build, um, you know, if you if for, for someone for every person who's, say, an eight-hour sleeper or seven-hour sleeper, you need 16 or 17 hours of wakefulness in a row to, to earn the right or to get that level of sleepiness and to get that amount of sleep. Uh, there was a question around the hours of sleep too and how we talked about before, like we recommend seven to nine or anywhere between six and 10. And maybe you know, people who think, oh, I'm really sleepy. I should have been worried about getting 10. I said, no, but, I mean, I don't know how people can get 10. <laughs> I'd love to, you know, but but, it, but some people, it can be normal for that person and just their genetics. Um but, yeah, the people who say, I only need four hours sleep, you know, Kevin Rudd, Ronald Reagan, Maggie Thatcher, Einstein, there's all these, you know, public figures who, Trump, <laughs> who don't need much sleep. But the tell-all biography says that they were sleeping all the time. They were napping in the cab. They were napping in their office. They were grumpy. 
um, some of them that you know had dementia later on. There was so it's, it's there's no one that is at. Um, I think there's a there's a tiny amount of people, like well over less than zero zero point one percent of people who really do genuinely not need much sleep, but ninety nine point something do need minimum six hours, and we know that from just long standing epidemiological studies that have been around with you know big cohorts of thousands of people over many years and there's a really clear there's this um a you inverted you that, that people who sleep less than six and more than say 11 or 12 routinely uh there's a really clear association with increased morbidity and increased mortality so meaning just more more health problems and a and a reduced life so it's that's just the, the facts so but the people, you know, so a lot of the people who think I only need four or five, it's a bit it's a bit similar to maybe the smoking and the skin cancer that it's you're fine now, but just be aware of the risks and, you know, and smoke at your own peril or give up if you think, oh, look, I might, I do, I think I'll reduce the risks and just see how I, I'd rather be healthier when I'm older. So it's the same kind of thing. Yeah, 20 minute power lunch, absolutely. Like, so yeah, it's, it's, we're, we're pre programmed to have it. There's actually a natural dip. We're all the only people in their right minds are those in the Mediterranean who have a power nap. Or they, in fact, they shut the banks and go go off for hours. But um, yes, sleep up. Uh, well, I, I'll leave you. I won't get distracted. I'll keep, try not to look at yeah, the questions. There's one that seems to be another hot topic, and, and we'll go to sleep inhibitors like caffeine and alcohol next. But yes. um, yeah, there's uh, there's been a lot of questions about magnesium specifically, and maybe in addition, you could talk about um, melatonin. Um, any other um, generally accepted sleep aids and your perspective on on the um, uh, how useful they are. Yeah, sure. And I'm, the caveat is that you know I'm a psychologist by trade, not a not a prescribing person, so I don't have any right to you know prescribe or, or talk too much about all that. But yeah, the antihistamine comes up all the time, so I can talk broadly, of course. And, and Sleep House Foundation has fact sheets on all this sort of stuff too. Like, look, we've got a hundred different topics on our website of different um, resources and different fact sheets. We call them. So, I guess I can start with um, the histamine, or you know, anti um, histamine is yeah. People, it definitely makes people sleepy. Obviously, you know, parents uh, got onto that and giving kids finergan, and so it's not recommended. It's not a recommended sleep aid although it does induce sleepiness. It's not a hypnotic. It doesn't actually help with improving sleep. People often use it over the counter because it's just it's easier to get. It's cheaper, it's less stigma, uh, less addictive perhaps than, say, a, a benzodiazepine, a type of like a Valium or a, or a Temazepam. Um, <clears throat> I think it's, uh, it's true to say that they're just, just to, had to be cautioned. Every single thing, whether it's Panadol for, you know, a headache, whether it's, melatonin for jet lag or for you know for improving your sleep everything you think is oh it can't be that can't be that bad it's pretty low dose and it's pretty harmless we all just have to have a x amount of a certain amount of caution about anything that we put into our mouth it does it always has some kind of effect um anecdotally you know i have known people who are on melatonin they've been on it since 1996 because one of my jobs when i was studying you know um and worked landed at the sleep center was uh, looking at um a melatonin receptor agonist drug trial, and I was the coordinator of that drug trial for people who were totally blind. So that, well, I, this was news to me that people who are totally blind don't get the light dark hues, so don't have melatonin at the have, a, have melatonin at either no melatonin or haphazard doses, and it's really problematic for them. So we did this trial, um, and now obviously it's used much more ubiquitously, not just for jet lag, but for for helping with sleep regulation. Um, so I would be cautious if you, I know, I know that in the audience there'd be lots of people on melatonin and their children would be too, because it's the most commonly used supplement in the world for children and adults. Um, and the only, with a fact sheet on that, there's lots of, look up the conversation actually, recent, lots of, um, there's an online article on called The Conversation, for those who don't know, it's a free um, academic based, you know, newspaper online. Uh, I don't know what we've got in our fact sheet at the moment. Well, I hope it's updated. I'll make sure it is after this straight away so I can put, put people onto our fact sheet because we do want people to have a bit of caution around melatonin and that's because the trials that have been done, even though I said anecdotally some people I know have been on it and they're fine still, but the trials are only really about six weeks or three months afterwards that follow up. So you don't, no one really knows the long-term effects 
that's all I can say on that in that and it should be quite low dose like a lot of people on really high doses that the physicians I used to work with will only give people one or three milligrams of melatonin so I'm not sure why people on really long like really like big doses of like 10 milligrams and stuff like that surprises me so I think there's just not a lot of people knowing um about it um and yeah so that's all I can say and magnesium as well I think that it's clearly a lot of people are on that for helping with um you know deficiencies and and if they're like they're restless at night it does help keep your legs still iron as well I know even personally I do I take magnesium I take iron or ferritin supplements but it's just that's just again that's not that's just what I do and I know it works for me I would everything you do I would do it you know in conjunction with um good advice under the care of your healthcare practitioner um and yeah and be really cautious if you are on sleeping pills like prescribed sleeping pills talk that might be better it's about that's better than not sleeping at all that's for sure um and it's much safer than taking other drugs um like al alcohol for sleep is really poor it's a really poor 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 choice although a common one you're not alone if you're drinking alcohol to make you a bit sleepy but even really it really is poor it's actually my honest thesis back in 96 as well was on alcohol and sleep and really low doses even a couple of glasses of wine close to bed is quite dramatic uh, on your sleep architecture and your um, more snoring more breathing disturbance more sleep disturbance so alcohol um, and other drugs probably you know be cautious anyway but give yourself three hours three to four hour buffer so a couple of glasses or beers with dinner at seven make sure that you don't have anything else before 10 like give yourself a few hours to get the alcohol out of your system cbd oil cannabis so i can make a quick comment on that is um well not the cannabis the actual you know the 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 all the healthy stuff is still in there and it's a it's a uh there's emerging evidence of that it's you know good for sleep but also there's stacks and stacks of long-term clients of mine that over the years who have tried it and it was always, they thought it was going to be this panacea. It was going to be, oh, the final, nothing else has worked and, and this will work. But it, it hasn't necessarily done that much for them. So there's mixed results there. And, and again, a like bit of bit of caution. But, but you know, experiment with, with your GP. A lot of GPs are really open to it. There's people that do prescribe it. Um, but it, again, it's not the first thing you go to. The first, it's, the, it's after you've exhausted trying to manage your other other things if you can your stress your your routines your light dark cycle your your sort of your lifestyle behavioral changes your food all that sort of change all that as, and then if nothing else works at all then you can think about supplementation um and most of it's okay sleep trackers gosh we could talk about that too <laughs> i'm going to pull up your um uh, your sheet here in just a sec because I want to give we have we have about 10 minutes left we have uh, so 26 many questions right that I'm not going to be able to get to um, but I want to give everybody an opportunity to um, connect follow um, see the, yes, the fact sheet um, and, yeah, and start because this is what uh, the, the, this is an evolving practice um, mm -hmm. We have lifestyles that evolve and certainly per people's personal circumstances will evolve over time, um, children and, and the, the nature of the role and things that they have. So a really yes. good way to stay educated, um, yeah, is, is get connected with, with Moira and the Sleep Health Foundation. I am going to take That's a couple of audience questions now. And um, this yep. is one from um, uh, uh, one of our favorite clients, Patrice. And this might be uh, relatable to a few of you. So working as part of a global organization, the hours are quite demanding and inconsistent. So early mornings and late nights. Do you have any uh, tips for Patrice or anyone in that situation for unwinding um, after a late night meeting or, or waking up in an optimal state for those early morning meetings? Yeah, yeah, well, uh, it's tricky. I think the, the tricky thing is that it's probably inconsistent, I guess. It's not all the time. It's just sometimes. It's not like every single day you have to get up. So if you, if possible, making it consistent. If Like if you're walking across time zones, then try and do that as consistently as you can, consistently as you can. I think still try to get a minimum six, seven, eight hours if you can. Like you might have to be catching naps, become really good at, the, at power naps to supplement the sleep disturbance that you're getting as a occupational hazard if you like like is it it's just part of parcel of your lifestyle and um but you know family and work commitments i think 
it's important to um, massage the light dark to your advantage. So if you're someone who's, if you're waking up super sleepy, which you would because if you're getting ad inadequate sleep, try to get back to sleep if you can. If you can't, it's a really good idea just to get up and get exercise and get moving, have a shower, do half an hour, you know, do some kind of physical exercise, have something to eat, get going with your day and monitor the tired signs and sleepy signs that you have and have have naps periodically throughout the day if you if this is your lot reality in life and the reality of course of of young children and I remember that in my mind growing up I've only got I've got one left at home once you at high school the other two are a bit older and left um and but I remember unprecedented sleepiness and tiredness and driving around thinking God, I shouldn't be driving like I know I'm sleepy I know I shouldn't be on the roads but you know, and, and going to work, and and ironically talking to people about their sleep, and thinking, gosh, I, you know, I hardly had any myself last night. But at least, but mine wasn't insomnia. Mine was my lifestyle. Mine was sort of asomnia, like absence of sleep, rather than a difficulty because I knew exactly how to get sleep. I just couldn't get it um, because of what, what just the, the phase I was in. Um, so, Patrice, yeah, I think it's it's going to be different things for different people. I think that uh, a sleep study would only be indicated if you had, you know, if it's suspected some kind of sleep apnea, which is, you know, absence of breathing. It's a very common sleep disorder. Insomnia is the most common at, you know, 30 or 15, 12, 15 percent. Sleep apnea is at least, say, 5 percent. Um, there's different, lots of different sort of statistics and prevalence around sleep apnea. People often think it's a male disorder, and it is, but until when people are women are in menopause onwards, the risk of sleep apnea is just the same as that of men. So you actually, with four menopause, men are four, life, four times more likely to have sleep apnea than women, and at menopause onwards, women are just as much at risk of sleep apnea. So you'll know someone who has sleep apnea that have this periodic absence of breathing and um, often associated with loud snoring, absence, quiet, and then you know, choking sounds. So the excessive daytime sleepiness, falling asleep unintentionally, um, is one of the and morning headaches and just general grumpiness, feeling awful. Um, it, you get, definitely have to get sleep apnea checked out via a sleep study. Is the only way you'll know is that having a sleep study and making sure it's looked at by a sleep physician. Um, it's really important that someone with you know who qualified looks at the sleep study and gives you proper treatment options, whether it's going to be a mask at night, a, a mouse splint, weight loss, surgery. There's different options which we won't go into because of time. I mean, I, I can speak to that. My, my dad was diagnosed with sleep apnea about 15 years ago, and it has the the mask has transformed his life, his energy levels, yeah. his outlook. So yes. it is yeah, Fantastic. get yourself get yourself seen. Um, there's a, a lot of questions here, and I think uh, again, this is probably relatable to a lot of people, but the relationship between exercise and sleep, and I think we we better understand now that a good sleep routine actually often starts in the morning. Um, what advice do you have for people there? Absolutely. The best thing you can do is, you know, you're, yeah, you're getting up and getting out in the light, preferably moving. If, if, you've, if you can't do that, at least sit and have your breakfast cup of tea in the light. Um, the, the best thing you can do is, is that consistency, consistency across across time, across every seven, seven days, plus or minus an hour or two. So if you're getting up at six all the time, don't sleep in much beyond eight on your days off, um, just to sort of try and keep that consistency um so many questions so many things um what was the question again Matt about like I don't think I answered it properly no that's yeah, no the the, yeah, the rela in, okay. any relationship that, uh, between exercise and sleep that you have a lot exercise of yeah so yeah exercise um we used to say up until about 10 years ago don't exercise at night because I thought it just disrupts everyone the really clear evidence that exercise is good any time of the day or night preferably in the morning but any time you can get exercise it's really good for sleep because you you, know, you wear yourself out. Hopefully, when you're outside, it's helping with um, suppressing melatonin. I think that um, if you do really long exercise, though, if you're someone who trains for two hours, like two-hour runs or two-hour big gym sessions, then you'd be cautious about doing that too close to bed. But apart from that, nothing is really too problematic any time of day or night. But exercise, minimum 30 minutes a day, people who exercise 30 minutes a day, and just generally have good sort of healthy habits in general are more likely to have good sleep. And even the busiest, busiest, busiest person, you just got to try and make it work. Maybe walking meetings or, or you know, playing with the kids, 
jump running through their footy training together and said whatever you can do to make it work that you have to move your body to get good sleep but the opposite can't be true that people think oh they, they do too much and try and smash themselves and then they're too tired to sleep like people who do the, the, the tour de france guys they only sleep four or five hours a night in that three-week period because they've smashed themselves and they, they their body's over stimulated um so yeah there's a balance so maybe half an hour of exercise an hour max don't smash yourself um and i think that's true with a lot of things there's there's the evidence based now where incidental movement throughout the day is actually more important than your primary exercise. So just being conscientious, walking meetings, things like that. So we're going to focus we on the things that we can control. We've talked about um, sort of the routine. We've talked about um, uh, exercise. I think another important part of that triangle is nutrition. Um, there's the old myth that turkey puts us to sleep. Uh, what does a good diet look like, um, and potentially things to avoid that that aren't so assist uh, uh, don't assist us in sleeping? Yeah, absolutely. So of course the obvious stuff around caffeine, you know, too much stimulation and and preservative. So it's if you're eating as fresh as possible with no not many barcodes and wrappers and numbers on it, then you're going to have a much more uh, increased chance of good sleep, and um, also not sleep not eating. Too, cl too close to dinner time, to, to meals, making sure that you have a couple of hours at least of digestion time. Um, good food. So there's there's lots of talk around certain certain foods, like say, you know, for instance, blueberries or like there's, there's ones that have been identified that are good for sleep. But I suppose at the moment we're at a point of which it's a bit like the brown noise and the it's like let's just get the basics right first and, of course, so and eliminate all these other things. Um, and see how you go with the relationship to food but it's very it is very interesting if um, there's more and more emerging work with sleep and food I think that you know looking up the the center for food and mood here in Melbourne Deakin have some fantastic outputs around around us and watch this space for more collaborations and know we'll know more about it I think that yeah in general protein will um like say for lunch i know tr heavy vehicle truck drivers are discouraged from having like burgers and pastas and all carbs because it makes you sleepy makes you a bit like you know that feeling I, I actually can't really have sandwich for lunch i just have to have sort of lean protein and salad or something because i feel too sleepy afterwards so keep that in mind that you know that carbs will make you feel a little bit sleepier protein will make you feel a bit more alert but it's not not that strong it's a bit like you know it's, it's going to be you have to work it out for yourself really um often it's not so much the food sometimes people are having like 1.5 liters of diet coke and they haven't really realized that's a lot of caffeine and they've um, and they don't they don't know oh, don't drink too coffee so just being aware of that um and being aware of um just whether you maybe are missing out on some some vital nutrients which might be like say the magnesium shortage you might be making your muscles switch a bit at night and make, make you a bit restless so there's Leah there's, I, I'm very happy to um for people to contact me if you know via like follow on, on the socials um love to come back you know maybe every year we could do a talk there's so much to talk about I know I'm just seeing the top the, the, the tick ticking clock <laughs> no, yeah we have we have two minutes we have 18 un unanswered questions <laughs> sorry I will uh, I'll share these with you more, but please um, get in touch with um, the Sleep Foundation. Um, I think let's choose one more before we wrap. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, some yeah, there's been a lot of questions around Matt Walker's why we sleep. I've seen that two or three times. Are you familiar yeah. with the literature, and what do you think? Yeah. Yep. Yep. When he's Richie Digi, you know, sleep guy from the states or you know Britain originally. He, yeah it's all it's all good like he's it's true what he says my problem with Matt and I've told him this we, we shared a podcast once on Radio National last year um is that it's a little bit heavy-handed sometimes he's toned it down a lot more that with the messages like you're all going to die you're going to get cancer because how you have to actually you're not going to sleep well if you're really really worried and tense about your sleep so that's the only thing with Matt Walker so He'll say, like, he's one of his TED Talks starts with testicles and, like, you know, you're all going to have less testosterone and get getting people scared into getting into bed earlier. But my problem is I see the people who, despite best efforts, they're, they're still not getting sleep. So that person doesn't need to be worried any more than they are about their sleep and their testicles. And so it's, um yeah, so, Matt, so it's a good book. But, but uh, you know, I'd rather, I just have a different approach. Like, we uh, uh, because he's not doing selling a fantastic book and he's doing international tours on the stage and he's very entertaining and it's just but the sleep health messages at the public level 
need to just be a little bit more um, uh, tailored, I think. Yeah, very diplomatic. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so some 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 notes that um, that I took today that I think we can all anchor in is um, thinking about asomnia as opposed to just insomnia. Um, if this uh, poor quality sleep is sustained and it's really impacting your quality of life, um, both having difficulty getting to sleep or maintaining sleep, perhaps um, see a professional. I love the tired but wired and, and checking with ourselves, are we tired or are we sleepy? Um, and I think... Uh, Moira, I mean, that you are, we could have spoken for three hours. Um, you are a wealth of knowledge here. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I would love to make this an annual event. So we'll discuss yes. that offline. Um, any final words from you? No, just that, just um, sleep well and, and maintain the prioritizing, but also maintain hope. For all those ones of you who thought it was terrible, I hope I want you to get it ten percent better in the next week. Just aim for just small, small improvements, small tweaks at a time. Thank you, and um, happy World Sleep Day for Friday. Um, thank you yes. again for joining everybody yeah. today. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Matt. Bye, Take everyone. Care. Thanks, everybody. Bye, bye.